Welcome back for part seven, the building science for dry climate video series with Franklin Energy. In this video, we're gonna look at duct testing and duct leakage calculations. Be sure to watch the other videos in the series. They're presented in a way that's meant to help you evaluate a house as a system and inform your approach to deliver affordable, comfortable, and energy efficient homes to your customers. Let's look at the purpose and protocols for duct testing and how to calculate duct leakage. Most folks who know even just the basics about energy efficiency and HVAC understand that if your duct system is in poor condition, you'll be wasting a lot of heating and cooling energy, meaning higher heating and cooling costs. Another common symptom of a really leaky duct run is an uncomfortable room or some other part of a home because the conditioned air is never reaching its intended destination, leaving a cold room cold in the winter or a warm room warm in the summer. But three lesser known reasons to test ductwork is because leaks, like the one seen here in the picture, also allow external pollutants and contaminants to be drawn into a home. The way this works is that it's hard to keep the house's internal pressure neutral when your air handler is drawing all the return air through your return side of your ducts, let's say 1200 CFM, to be heated or cooled. But as that conditioned air then gets pushed into your supply side ducts, if you have significant leak like the one seen here, you could be losing 150 to 200 CFM into the unconditioned space, which really means inside your home, your air handler is removing 1200 CFM and only putting back about 1000 causing measurable amounts of depressurization, which could drive unwanted shell infiltration and even draw undesirable air from the area around the disconnected duct. And in some cases, the depressurization in a home can be significant enough to backdraft our natural draft combustion appliances, like most gas water heaters and some older furnaces, which rely on natural draft vents to allow the combustion exhaust to just float on out of the house. It doesn't take much negative house pressure to overcome the buoyancy of the hot gases floating up the vent. The wasted heating and cooling energy and the associated savings that homeowners can realize with effective duct sealing are usually what helps to make a sale. But don't forget to point out that there's a lot more duct work on the supply side and more opportunity for leakage. And when you have a dominant supply side leakage, your home will be depressurized and your home will experience even more infiltration than normal. That longer runtime not only costs more each month, it decreases the operating life of the equipment, just like a high mileage vehicle. We see stuff like this more than you might think. This type of catastrophic failure will lead to enormously high bills, uncomfortable parts of the house, and poor indoor air quality. Those black marks on the yellow insulation are also signs of duct leakage. Years of air leaking through and the small particles of dust and dirt getting filtered through the insulation, a telltale sign of air leaking near that discoloration. These images remind us that when we talk about indoor air quality, we're not just talking about carbon monoxide or VOCs and moisture, like in some other previous presentations. We're also talking about pesticides and rodent feces and other allergens that are outside. Do you know any friends or have family members who live with chronic health and respiratory issues? Keeping pollutants out, well, even when the systems are off, the ducts located in those unconditioned zones to have potential to draw in or suck in those contaminants from those spaces. Leaky ducts can also bring in the unwanted temperatures from hot and cold attics, if not sealed well. This slide shows the potential for our furnace or air conditioner to pressurize our individual rooms while simultaneously depressurizing the main body of a home or those parts that are connected to the return register. This pressure imbalance can be minimized by keeping interior doors open or with adequate gaps at the bottom of the door. 
things that cause negative zone pressure and potential backdrafting issues are things like this return plenum that looks fine at first glance. When you pull back the insulation, you can see leakage spots around the tabs of the start collar. Let these four key points guide your duct inspection procedures. Visually inspecting the duct system thoroughly, inspecting around the fan cabinet and the return grill, even inspect where the register is and how it's finished uh, with the finished surfaces, and making note of any conditions that might prevent duct sealing. When you're visually inspecting a duct system, you're looking for large leaks, disconnected fittings, or other kinds of major damage to the ducts. You're looking for things that will make it difficult or even dangerous to repair, like asbestos or inaccessible ducts. With registers removed, you can inspect the condition of the inside of the ductwork, or if wall or floor cavities are being misused as plenum, or if the boot and grills have been sealed to the finished surfaces. Lastly, you should be assessing the condition of the joints in the ductwork, but especially the transitions from one type of material to another, like from rigid to flex ducts. You should be looking at the entire system from top to bottom. When you're inspecting the fan cabinet return register, you should be checking for the following conditions. Are there any unlined return plenums? Is the return grill sealed to the finished wall or ceiling material? Are the plenums around the air handler sealed with mastic and mesh tape? And are the penetrations on the fan cabinet itself taped or sealed closed? When you inspect to verify if the boot is sealed to the floor, you'll likely find plenty that look like this, where the boot is not sealed to the floor. I've seen the drawing on the left using caulk to seal the boot to the floor. But I've seen contractors fold aluminum tape from the edge of the floor down into the boot, where the amount of tape on the finished floor can be covered by the register. That's another option to consider. Things that could prevent a duct sealing job include an appliance that just can't be repaired or running across ducts that have asbestos on them. If the ducts are inaccessible, they can't be sealed. These are usually considered inside the building cavities, but if the attic or crawl space access was too small, you might not be able to perform duct sealing effectively. When I bought my house that I live in now, it was 20 years old. And when I did a duct leakage test, I only measured 4.7% leakage, which is based on the nominal system size and assumed airflow. 4.7 is pretty low. When I crawled around in the attic, I discovered a much newer furnace and air handler. The ductwork had already been sealed. Most utility programs won't incentivize duct sealing when the existing leakage is already at or below the program threshold. Sometimes you just find ductwork so torn up that it's just beyond repair and needs to be completely replaced. And lastly, if the ductwork is in conditioned space, who cares if it's leaking? It won't qualify for utility program incentives and wouldn't have a very good savings to investment ratio, meaning you wouldn't realize any real savings on your energy bills to offset the cost of the labor and materials for the duct sealing work. Let's shift gears now and look at how we measure and calculate duct leakage. First, we determine the amount of airflow for the system. We either use an assumed amount of airflow based on the size of the equipment, this is referred to as the nominal system airflow, or we measure it with one of the approved measurement methods and we call that the actual or measured system airflow. We measure duct leakage at 25 pascals of pressure and can use either the duct leakage to outside test method or the total duct leakage method. You're just supposed to use the same method for test in and test out. And you calculate the duct leakage as a percentage of the total system airflow. And that duct leakage target is equal to or less than 5% when 100% of the accessible ducts are replaced. 
The way we communicate duct leakage is usually a percentage of total system airflow. It's common in many programs to use the nominal system airflow. A theoretical or assumed airflow rate is based on the size of the system. For heating systems, we use 0 0.0217 CFM times the output of BTUs. Or by moving the decimal three places, it can also be said as 21.7 CFM per thousand BTUs. With cooling systems, we use 400 CFM per ton of cooling as the nominal airflow. You should calculate both and use the larger of the two numbers. There are four approved methods for measuring total system airflow, each requiring a specific piece of equipment. The four methods are plenum pressure matching, flow grid measurement, powered flow capture hood, and the traditional flow capture hood. Let's look at each method more closely. Plenum pressure matching uses a duct blaster to match normal operating system static pressure. First, measure the static pressure at its highest operating speed with all the registers open and filter removed. Then, turn it off, connect a duct blaster to the return plenum, and pressurize the system to the same static pressure. The CFM reading on the manometer is the actual airflow. Truth is, this technique is not used very much. Most people consider it a little bit too much work or too complicated. And sometimes there can even be access issues. The flow grid measurement uses the true flow air handler flow plate from the Energy Conservatory. First, you measure static pressure of the system running without a filter. Then you insert the flow plate into your filter slot. And with the system running, the flow plate can send a pretty accurate reading to your manometer. And with some quick static pressure calculations, you get a total system airflow number. This method is easy to use, but the flow plate equipment is expensive and not often used in the field. Here you can see the flow meter. It has multiple options for size and even add-on pieces to fit whatever filter size slot you might have. It's hard to see in this picture. There are two or three inch holes in the plexiglass and the black tubing has many small holes and the pressure created in the black tube can be used to extrapolate total airflow moving through the meter. The flow capture hood technique uses a bolometer or flow hood and with the system running, and the filter in, you can measure air flowing through the return register. And if there's two or even three returns, then you measure each one and add them together for the sum of returns. This is the most popular method because it's quick and easy, and a flow hood could be used for other things like measuring supply register airflow rates and system balancing. A powered flow hood is considered more accurate because it uses a fan to balance the static pressure between the room and the flow hood. Here's a typical flow hood. You place the hood over the register and it can quantify the airflow through the hood in cubic feet per minute. You need to know that some of the less expensive flow hoods don't give accurate results at the higher CFM flows. And if you need to measure a return register, you really should be using a flow hood that has the calibration to read those much higher airflow rates. And once you've established the system size and total system airflow, this is the duct blaster used to measure the duct system leakage. It's a fan with ductwork that is attached and sealed at a return register. For overhead return registers, you can strap the duct blaster to a ladder if needed. Notice the use of cardboard and tape to seal off the rest of the return. To get the duct leakage measurement, make sure that the system is working properly, but is turned off for the test. For the most accurate results, you should have all of the other mechanical fans in the house turned off as well. With your duct blaster tied in at the return, you seal off all the other registers with tape or the wooden duct blockers product you can see in this picture on the right. Check the condition of the filter. If it's normal wear, we leave them in. 
But if there's excessive debris and dust, you take it out. What's been left out from this slide is that the technician uses a probe and a tube and inserts the metal probe through the tape into one of the nearby supply registers and connects the tube to the manometer. There's also a tube from the fan housing go into the manometer as well. And with the house in this condition, you can now turn on the duct blaster and read the pressure created in the ductwork. You increase the speed of the fan, which increases the pressure in the ducts until you reach a pressure of 25 pascals. And at that pressure, you can also read the total airflow through the duct blaster fan that is required to maintain that pressure. And that's the total duct leakage number. Let's say the manometer reads 100 CFM at 25. That's the amount of airflow through the fan at 25 pascals of pressure in the ducts. If you were testing the ducts of a system with a three ton air conditioner, we said earlier that you could use nominal system airflow of 400 CFM per ton. Well, if you times that by three, gives us a nominal or assumed system airflow of 1200 CFM for that system. And if you divide the 100 CFM 25 leakage number that we measured by the 1200 CFM system airflow, you get a total of 12% of total duct leakage. That's it. That's how you do a total duct leakage test. Another way to measure duct leakage is the duct leakage to outside test, which works a lot like the way we just described, but adds a second piece of equipment into the mix. We use a blower door in conjunction with the duct blaster to measure duct leakage to outside. Using the blower door, we pressurize the house to 25 pascals and then use the duct blaster to pressurize the duct system to 25 pascals. Any of the duct leakage that would have leaked into the house is negated by the house pressure. So all of the duct leakage measured is what's actually leaking to the unconditioned space outside. The duct leakage to outside test gives you a better understanding of the energy savings potential, where the total duct leakage test gives you a better insight to some comfort and distribution issues. The leakage to outside test only captures the amount of air leaking outside the shell, right? The duct leaks that are in the attic or crawl space. But we know there's duct leaks inside a home too. And by pressurizing the house, and the ducts to the same pressure, you negate that inside leakage. And from an energy perspective, who cares about inside leakage? If you're paying for heat, and the hot air is indeed inside the house, who cares? It's still heating the house. Duct leakage to outside is always lower than the total duct leakage. But most of the utility programs use duct leakage to outside because they're focused more on the actual energy savings, more so than specific comfort and distribution issues. In summary, it's important to remember that duct testing and duct sealing provide more than just energy savings and comfort. It's critical for indoor air quality, health, and safety as well. Start with a visual inspection. All the ducts, the forced air unit, registers, all of it. Calculate the system airflow using nominal or measured system airflow. Actual airflow should be measured with one of the approved measuring methods using plenum pressure, flow hood, or flow grid methods. Set up the house correctly and measure the duct leakage with a duct blaster. You can measure total duct leakage or bring in a blower door as well and measure duct leakage to outside. Both tests provide detailed insight into the condition of the duct system but be sure you know if one or the other might be required for the type of compliance testing you're reporting for. And you should always use the same method at test in and at test out. Thank you. Be sure to watch the other videos in the Building Science for Dry Climates video series with Franklin Andrews.